All right, so in Titus chapter 3, um, I'm going to be focusing on the latter part of, that, of this chapter this morning. Now, in case you are unaware, we, um, I've been attacked this week by people who are, are basically pro-sodomite and pro-homosexual, and they don't seem to have a problem with that, uh, with that sin. What, what's, what's ended up happening is that someone wrote an article about me and how hateful I am and what a horrible person I am and all this other stuff because they found a video that was posted up to YouTube back in December. And apparently this is news now, right? I mean, it's something from, from December is news now. And in case, I don't know if everyone was here then or whatever, but that was back around the time Pastor Anderson and Faithful Word was uh, preached a sermon about AIDS, and basically, you know, he he said something that that was inflammatory to some people, which I have no problems with anything that he preached in that sermon. Just to let everybody know where I stand on that, zero problems with what he preached. But he was saying that in order to have an AIDS-free Christmas, that if we just instituted the death penalty on homosexuality, then we would have an AIDS-free Christmas if we were able to do that. And I have no problems with him saying that because what he said is scriptural, it's biblical. That's right. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13, the Bible says, um, you know, if, any man had, uh, if a man lie with another man, he lies with a woman, they too shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And that's what the Bible lays out for uh, punishment for sodomy, for homosexuality. That's what the Bible says. Now, we need to derive our laws from somewhere. And this is, this is what boggles my mind. I, I talk to people that, that don't agree with this, but it's like, we have a human government. We need to punish, we have to have laws in place, and we need to punish, uh, have, have cri uh, punishments associated with those crimes. For example, murder. I'm sure nobody here would say, well, yeah, we shouldn't have a law against murder. Of course we should have a law. Oh, but that's the Old Testament. Oh, that, they said that in Leviticus and in Exodus. It's ridiculous. Okay? And you know what else Leviticus says? It says not to marry your sister. I think we should still have laws against that as well. There's lots of things that are provided in the Old Testament that are, that are moral laws and things that we ought to have laws against today. Amen. So we say, okay, here's our laws. Well, what should the punishment be? Well, the Bible is very clear about what punishment should be for different crimes that you break. If someone steals, they pay back fourfold or fivefold, depending on what the nature of what they stole. If somebody kills, they need to be put to death. If somebody commits adultery, they need to be put to death. Look, this is what God has ordained as a righteous judgment on crime, on specific crimes. And the crime, yes, the crime of homosexuality it's not just an alternative lifestyle, which is what the world and what Satan is going to try to get you to think to accept a perverted way of life. The crime of homosexuality because they're perverts and they're pedophiles and they go out to recruit people and you read Romans chapter 1 and you can see all of the different attributes of someone who's given over to a reprobate mind. And you'll start to understand a little bit more why that's such a big deal. And look, even if you don't understand it, you have to think, why did God, why did God Almighty put a death sentence on that crime? If you don't think it's that bad, just think about that for a minute. Think about why would God say, no, they deserve to be put to death? Why did God reign fire and brimstone down on an entire city of people because their wickedness was exceeding great. And we're going to be getting into that in our Genesis series as well on Wednesday nights. But, but think about that. He didn't do that because there was a bunch of, uh, there was a whole town full of people who were thieves. He didn't do that because there was a town full of people who were liars. He did it to the Sodomites. In fact, that's where we get the name Sodomite from. It's from Sodom. And it carries through all the way up to you know, thousands of years later. The name is still used to identify people who committed such wicked things. And that's worthy of death. So I was attacked because I believe that we should have a law in the land that says homosexuality is against the law. And if you break that law, you're worthy of death. Okay, that's, and, and I'll stand by that. And you could attack me. You can say, oh, Jesus taught to love and all this other stuff. And all the other attacks that come against you, you know, till you're blue in the face. But I'm not changing what I believe because what I believe is founded on the Bible. Amen. And it's God's Word. And so I've been attacked by this. And 
The sermon today isn't about homosexuality or any of that stuff. Okay, I just want to lay the groundwork to let you know where I'm coming from. Because what's going to happen is, and, and these attacks may come to you too. Being associated with our church, coming to our church. Someone knows, oh, hey, you're, oh, you go to that church where that pastor is. He's just, and they say, Yo, he's just full of hate. They see one thing, like one little clip, right? Does that, does, would, would anyone here say that that identifies everything that's all about me is like my stance on homosexuality requiring a death penalty? It must, it must right? That's, that's it. Like if, if you see it on the news or if you read an article online, wow, this guy's just full of hate. I can't believe this guy. It's so ridiculous because people speak out of ignorance all the time. People get knee-jerk reactions. They have no idea what you're all about. Anybody who actually knows this church knows what we're all about. I'm not waking up every day going, man, I just want to kill those homosexuals. Oh, I, just, I just can't sleep at night until this happens. I'm so full of hate. But this is what they'll portray you out to be. It's just this monster. Right? They, they demonize what you believe and make you out to be some, you know, a Hitler. Right? Or, or some, some really, really evil person. This is what they'll try to do. And unfortunately, these attacks will, will oftentimes lead people away from church, especially when they're not very solid and founded in their faith or in the church. They'll think, oh man, you know, when the persecution cometh, when that arises, you know, many people get offended and then they fall out and they, and they get out of church or they get out of that church or they get out of the Word of God because they don't like the attacks. Look, do I like being attacked? Do you think that's just enjoyable? Do you think I like reading all these emails and all the hate mails? Sometimes it's kind of funny, but I mean, overall, look, it's not enjoyable. I don't like my phone blowing up and with a bunch of people that want to chew me out and stuff. It's not enjoyable, okay? But to me, where I'm at, it's not a big deal either. I'm able to resist it. I'm very solid and founded in what I believe. These people aren't going to change my mind. They're not going to be like, oh, maybe I should love more. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm all wrong about this. Okay, that's not, that's not me. But other people who are maybe a little bit younger in the faith and still growing, they might get scared. They might get afraid of these things. And, and that could cause them to, to get out of church. So... The first thing I want to mention is just don't, don't let these attacks lead you out of church or lead you out of serving God or lead you out of reading the Bible or, or challenge your faith even. But stay strong in the faith. But what I want to point out here in Titus chapter 3, because this is what always happens, is people will try to engage you in foolish questions. People that want to challenge me on this position are always writing very, very foolish things. I've got, like I said, I've got a bunch of emails. Some are just hateful saying, I wish your children are sodomites and I wish, you know, suppose a Christian, some of these people are coming from Christians, if you could believe that. A Christian saying, I wish that your children will grow up to be a sodomite. This is what some people think. And these are people who will call themselves loving Christians, right? Oh, you hate, so I wish that your children grow up to be a, a, a perverted sodomite. But this is, this is the hypocrisy that you deal with when, when people have no understanding and no clue about the Bible and they're completely ignorant if they've been fed lies from birth and they've just are full of the wisdom of this world, the satanic wisdom of this world. Right. Titus 3 verse 9 says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. So I've had lots of heretics coming to me and trying to correct me on the Bible and they just need to be rejected. See, I don't answer these people because the Bible says to avoid foolish questions, avoid the contentions, avoid the strivings about the law. I don't need to fight with somebody else about what God's law says because it says what it says. Amen. It's right there. I don't need to, to convince the whole world that this is true, that, that, that this fight is about. And here's the thing, if I were to do that, I'd be getting distracted from the true goal and purpose anyways. These teachings, what I teach here about the Bible, it's for our church. It's for people who are saved, people who can understand what the Bible even says. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. The world can't receive it. They can't understand it. 
It's not going to make any sense to them. So in order for me, if, if I were just to continue these debates and these arguments and say, no, you're wrong, and because look, I can do it. I know the Bible well enough. I could go to the verses and I could prove without a doubt and, and try, you know, win an argument, but it's going to be fruitless and vain and unprofitable. It's going to do no good because I can guarantee you every single one of these people that is writing me and, and harassing me and calling me, they need to get saved. They're not saved. They don't even understand the Word of God. They're asking foolish questions. But this is what I want to preach on is avoiding foolish questions because it's going to be, um, it's going to come your way. People are going, to, are going to try to get you down this path. And it's funny because you hear that saying, like, there's no such thing as a stupid question. That's false because it's absolutely true. There are stupid questions. There's foolish questions. Otherwise, the Bible wouldn't say to avoid them. And the reason why I avoid them is because they're stupid, because they're foolish, because you're not going to be able to give a good answer to them, to someone who's, who's that ignorant to even ask the, the foolish question. Here's an example of a foolish question. Now, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this one is real common. And it's, it's funny, the ignorance of people, when, when, especially with the internet, because it's so easy to copy and paste things these days. So I, I, I kind of picked out one that I've seen very frequently. Because people who don't know, people, I mean, this is people who don't even, have never read the Bible cover to cover. They see something, oh yeah, that burn, ooh man, yeah, that got them. And they don't even know the truth or validity of these statements at all. They just keep copying, pasting, and just spreading lie after lie after lie. Here's an example of foolish questions. So it starts off saying, oh, thank you so much for you know, educating people regarding God's law. I've learned a great deal from your sermons trying to like, get you to read the whole thing because honestly, I don't read all these emails. Like, I just look at me like, okay, delete, 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 delete. Don't even waste my time on it. It's, it's real, it amuses me because some people spend like, all this time writing paragraph after paragraph. They wasted a bunch of time because I didn't even read it. <laughs> so I hope you feel good about yourself if you happen to be watching this video. But here's one where it says, um, when, it's, when someone tries to defend the homosexual lifestyle, for example, I simply remind them that Leviticus 18.22 clearly states to be an abomination. End of debate. I do need some advice from you, however, regarding some of the other specific laws and how to follow them. And he says, when I burn a bull on the altar as a sacrifice, I know it creates a pleasing odor for the Lord. The problem is my neighbors. They, can, they claim the odor is not pleasing to them. Should I smite them? So this is, you know, obviously they're trying to be funny and stupid and they're, and they're mocking God's word is what they're doing. No knowledge, no understanding, no, no discernment of the Old Testament and New Testament, what has changed, what hasn't, you know, with the, with the um, sacrifices. They think, oh yeah, that's still, you know, oh, we're going to go off the Old Testament without any taking the entire Bible in context. And, um, or another one, I would like to sell my daughter into slavery as sanctioned in Exodus 21. And by the way, this is not what Exodus 21 7 is talking about at all. Okay, these people, for one, they get the false versions of the Bible, which is part of the reason where they get some of these attacks from in the first place that talk about slavery and all these other things. Nothing to do with it. And most of the things that they say is just completely false and fabricated and not true at all. So they say, in this day and age, what do you think would be a fair price for her? The Bible never, never says to sell your children into slavery or that it's okay or anything like that. Never once. Um, let's see what else is here. I'm not going to read this. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff on here. Oh, yeah, this is real common. A friend of mine feels that even though eating shellfish is an abomination, it is a lesser abomination than homosexuality. I don't agree. Can you settle this? Like... This is, people are always asking me, oh, you think you should, you, know, you should put homosexuals to death? Do you eat shellfish? Yeah. You know, do you wear mixed fabric? And it's funny because they say mixed fabric as if putting anything together was against the law, which is not true either. It's very specific with um, woolen and linen is what, is what the Old Testament says. Now, I don't own any clothing that has woolen, wool and linen weave together as a fabric. I just don't have it. People are saying, oh, that suit that you wear is wool and cotton. This isn't wool. This is like polyester from China. Okay, this is not, you know, and people just come up with the, with the weirdest things. But what they end up doing is they're, they're mocking God's law and they're trying to say, oh, well, you're a hypocrite because 
you're not obeying all these other commandments. They have zero discernment. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand the Old Testament. They probably never even read the book cover to cover. And the, the biggest reason why they don't understand is because they're not saved. And, you know, these foolish questions I've been getting, the one of the reasons why they're foolish is because they're coming from fools. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, and I'm going to read for you from Psalm 14, verse 1, says, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Most of these people that are writing to me and that are, that are all upset about, about my stance on, on this topic of, of you know, capital punishment for homosexuality, they don't even believe in God. They don't believe there is a God. They're fools. Amen. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. That's what the Bible says about them. And in Proverbs 26, we'll see um, in verse 4 and 5, it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. And what I take away from that is, you don't want to be dealing with a fool at all because there's not a good way to deal with them one way or the other. You, do, you just want to avoid it altogether. That's why you avoid the foolish questions. Avoid the fools. Just, just don't even get yourself wrapped up in those types of arguments and foolish debates and these stupid questions that people ask. Oh, I want to sell my daughter into slavery. You idiot. That's not what the Bible says at all. You have zero understanding whatsoever, and that's not what the words even say. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And it's because this is one of the reasons why it's a vain, I mentioned this earlier, to argue with an unsaved person over what the Bible says. It's just because of the fact that they are unsaved. Verse number 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 reads, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So he's saying, you know, Human things, humanly things, just fleshly things, the spirit, our spirit is what helps us to know what those things are. Our spirit helps us to know about that stuff. But the things of God, you need the spirit of God to know what those things are about. We, you know, everybody is born with a spirit. We have a spirit inside of us, right? But when sin revives, that spirit dies. And that's why we need to be born again, because we're born of the spirit. And we have a new spirit that resides inside of us. Verse number 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But look at this in verse 14. But the natural man, the natural man is someone who's not saved, someone who doesn't have the Spirit of God. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Look, the words of the Holy Bible came from the Spirit of God. This is spirit. This is truth. This is life. The, uh, the natural man doesn't receive these things. They don't understand it. Keep reading. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man, which is another thing that, that people always throw at you when you say, yeah, I believe that homosexuality is a sin worthy of death that ought to be carried out in our human government today. They'll say, oh, you're not supposed to judge. You can't judge. Who are you to judge? I heard someone say, a pastor's not supposed to judge. What does the Bible say right here? He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Amen. Yeah, when you have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you, you do get to judge because God is telling you what's right and wrong based off of His Word. That is what we use the Holy Ghost as discernment to judge between what's right and what's wrong. This is where the judgment comes from. And it says, yet he himself is judged of no man. So really, they shouldn't be judging me for me judging homosexuality, a wicked sin that's worthy of death. Verse number 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Why do we have the mind of Christ? Because we have his words. And I'm not just talking about the words that he physically uttered 
while he was walking around on this earth. And it's another argument that people will use against me and say, oh, well, Jesus never personally condemned homosexuality. Yes, he did. Absolutely he did. These words are from Jesus Christ, God incarnate. Jesus is the Word. You cannot separate Jesus Christ from the Word of God. So when you read Leviticus, those are Jesus' words. Amen. He does condemn it. He's, he's, he's consistent with the Bible, with the law, with His own Word. We have His mind. We, we, we need to read the whole thing. Obviously, get the whole thing in context, but we have it all. Jesus never said that it was okay. Now, another portion of Scripture that the mockers will like to mock, you're in 1 Corinthians already. Turn to chapter 14. Because these are some of the things that are going to get you attacked these days. In the day that we live in, there are certain doctrines in the Bible, there are certain statements, there are certain scriptural references that, that people just don't like. It rubs them wrong. They don't want to hear it. It goes against what our society and what our culture teaches is acceptable or normal or right or what have you. Okay, But the world is not what determines what's right and wrong. God is the one that determines that. And this is why we're even in church today, because we're looking at God's word. We're trying to decide for ourselves. We need to combat the wisdom of this world and get our head in this book to see, well, the world's saying this. Is that even true? Well, here's what the truth is. And here's a, here's a topic that is not popular. Even in churches today, this isn't very popular. But we're going to read the Bible before I even expound on it at all. We're just going to read it and think in yourself, you know, if, if you find yourself trying to make excuses or say, well, how can this possibly be? Look, it says what it says. Okay, the Bible says what it says. And I'm not going to stand up here and try to change it to mean something other than what you can clearly read for yourself. I don't really need to do any extra, ex, extra explanation on this passage. But we're going to start reading in verse number 34, 1 Corinthians 14. The Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, look at this, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. What we just read, again, without any of my take on this at all, because some people will say, oh, well, that Paul, he was, you know, he was a sexist, he was a misogynist, he didn't like women. What he was writing were the commandments of the Lord. This is God's word. In verse number 38 says, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. And that last verse is kind of what ties in with what I'm saying, avoiding foolish questions. Look, some people are just going to be ignorant. They're going to be asking stupid questions. Hey, if they're going to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. Okay? But people don't like to see this because what does our society tell us? Our society says men and women are equal. They're the same. Anything a man can do, a woman can do. Anything a woman can do, a man can do. And they're going to try to teach you that that's exactly the way it should be. Now, I do not think that men are better than women or women are better than men. It's not the value of the person. It's the role. It's very, very obvious that God made men and women different. There are very many physical, obvious differences between men and women we're different creatures and thank god for that because we go together very well but we have different functions that god has ordained for us to do with our lives the reason why men are physically stronger than women and that's the way that god has made us and i don't care who you are men are stronger than women 
It's because we are to be workers and providers and being able to support the family. That is the role that God has ordained for us. The reason why a, a female's anatomy is the way it is is because God has designed her to bear children, to be able to care for them, to be nurturing. Look, these are very innate attributes that are undeniable. And you take that and you continue to go and say, okay, well, God has ordained that the, the, the man is the, the leader in the household. You can't have two people with equal votes in charge all the time because what do you do with a disagreement? How do you resolve that? When you have two people and they each have a vote, I vote this, I vote this, you're going to have strife and contention. Someone needs to be the, 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 the final say-so in matters. Now, does that mean that, that the wife or the woman has, you know, can't provide input and, and everything else? No. Okay, that's not what the Bible says, but there is one person that's the authority that's in charge. And that's the way that God has ordained it. Now look, some people, it rubs them the wrong way. They don't like to hear that. They don't, want to, they don't want to believe that. But how much do I really have to explain this passage that says, let your women keep silence in the churches because it's not permitted for them to speak? Okay, I'm not going to say that that means something other than what it just says. And I don't even feel like I need to explain that. Other than this fact, now... I will explain it in this way. When it's talking about keeping silence in the churches, it continues on. It says, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. This is talking about during the learning time, during the preaching time, during this time where, where, where the pastor's up and teaching and giving, his, uh, giving the, the sermon or the teaching from the Bible. That is what's time, because obviously we have singing, right? We all gather together and we have congregational singing and the women sing and the men sing and there's nothing wrong with that. We have, um, you know, other times during announcements, right? When it's, there's no teaching going on. We're just kind of going over the things that are going on with the church. Look, that's not the teaching time. It's fine. But according to the Bible, when it's, when it's time to learn, when it's time to, get to, to be taught, women are supposed to be silent in the church. And that's the way that we operate things here. And that's because of what Scripture says. And it is what it is. But, um, you know, a lot of people, again, the world today, that doesn't jive with the world. They'll be like, oh, how archaic. And they'll say, oh, you believe in Sharia law and all this other stuff. And you think women are less than, you know, less than you or all this other stuff. And that they're second class citizens. And all. No, no. Actually, I think women are to be honored and, and respected. They have a very difficult job. They're very lovely creatures and, 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 and people that, that, that have immense value. We value women. And in fact, and this is how backwards and corrupt this world is. You know, we used to have a society and culture where men would open up the door for a woman. Men would pull out a chair and stand up when a woman comes in and push them in and sit down and show courtesy and manners and respect for women. But the society we live in today is teaching you, well, hey, everyone's equal. And we're sending women out to fight on a battlefield. That's wicked. Amen. The men should be out there fighting. It's not the woman's job to go fight on a battlefield. Amen. What a disgrace. What a shame that this country is in with, with, with this, this agenda to just make a woman more like a man, which is all the feminist movement is, is that we just want to make women more like men. Go out, get a man's job, do all this other stuff, and, and be more like a man. How is that feminism? True feminism is trying to be as most like a woman as possible. That's the movement I believe in. That women should be feminine and exalt what God made them to be and really live up to that potential of being a woman. In, in every aspect that, that God has designed. Just like men should be manly in every sense that God has designed a man to be. But that doesn't go with the world. And you'll get attacked. And I'll probably get attacked for this video for saying these things today. But it's the Bible. Again, it's not, this isn't my opinion. I don't even have to expound on this. This is God's word. Amen. This is 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 22. Now, because normally when people are asking you foolish questions, at least as has been the case for me um, this week, 
they're usually looking to provoke you. They're trying to get you engaged in a debate and in an argument. And even though you might have all the answers to their foolish questions, it doesn't matter. It's going to be a waste of your time to go back and forth with these people because that's all they're trying to do is get you in a fight. And Satan will often do this even when you go out soul and you go knocking on doors because the devil doesn't want you getting people saved. So if he's got someone that can just keep you occupied and keep you busy at a certain door with someone who's just asking stupid question after stupid question, they're not listening to you and they just want to keep you engaged or get you in a debate or an argument, oftentimes you go a couple doors down and the person there is ready to get saved. That's right. So don't let them waste your time when you're out preaching the gospel because there are other people that will be willing to listen and aren't going to just, just bombard you with a bunch of stupid questions. The other reason that people ask foolish questions is to catch you in your words. And this is what happens too because they, they try to play it out like in that, the, the, the few things I read. They want to make you to look like a hypocrite. They want to make you to look like, oh, well, if you believe that, and, and what they're trying to do is just completely destroy all credibility. Now look, am I perfect in every single one of my beliefs and just have everything down exactly 100% that I know beyond a doubt that everything I believe is 100% true? No. So if you catch me in something where I believe an error on, okay, well, if that's an error, then that's an error, but it doesn't negate everything else that the Bible says or everything else that I believe about the Bible. But this is what they try to do. They try to catch you. And this is exactly what they did to Jesus. The people that rejected Jesus, the people who didn't believe on him, that didn't trust him, the people who actually wanted to have him crucified and kill him were the ones that were trying to catch him in his words. And look, this tactic has been around forever and it's not going away anytime soon. Matthew 22, look at verse number 15. It says, Then went the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees didn't believe on Jesus. The Pharisees were out to try to kill him and took counsel. Look at this. They, they, they literally got together and had a counsel. They talked about this, how they might entangle him in his talk. They got together and devised a plan and said, how can we get Jesus Christ to get mixed up in his words and to entangle him and to trap him in the things that he says? This is their objective. This is their goal. And the goal hasn't changed. People are out there trying to do this to Christians today, literally are trying to entangle them in their talk. Verse 16, And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. You like how they butter him up? Oh, we know that, that you, are, you are a teacher from God. You teach the truth. You don't regard any man. Right? That's how they get their foot in the door, saying, because they're trying to entangle him. Right? So they start flattering them and, and, and bring this flattery first. And then they, then they come with their trap. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Now, tribute is like a tax. So they're saying, is it lawful to pay taxes unto Caesar? Yes or no? Because, think about this. If Jesus were to say, no. You don't have to pay taxes. What's going to happen to him? He's going to be arrested. He's going to be, you know, they're, they're, and he's not going to be obeying like the, the law of the land. Okay. Now, does the Bible anywhere say that if you pay taxes to, to the government that you're in sin and that, and that it's against God's commandments? No, it doesn't say that. But Jesus perceives their wickedness. He says, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and he said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? So you're saying, why are you testing me? I see you're wicked. I know where you're going with this. I know you're trying to trap me in my words. He says, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, whose is this image and superscription? So he asked him, what, what, what picture is that on this, on this coin? Who is that? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their ways. He answered them very wisely. Now, did he say yes or no to that question? No. no. He did not come to, because we were like, why can't you just come and directly answer this question? Because you're trying to trap me. Because whatever I say, there's not a right answer to your question. 
And that's the way they, 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 they posit the question, is, is in a way that whether you answer yes or whether you answer no, it doesn't matter. They're, they're going to trap you in your words. So he's very wise and he says, okay, well, give to Caesar the thing that belonged to him and give to God the thing that, that way you can give to both. And he satisfies the question the way that it ought to be. Turn to Matthew, or oh, you're in Matthew 22, jump down to verse number 35. Because this is the same, I mean, in, within this chapter, they're still trying to trap him in his words. It says, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. That means he's testing him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, just to explain real briefly, if you love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself, the reason why all of the law and prophets hang on those two commandments is because you won't be committing any of these crimes against your fellow man if you love your neighbor as yourself. You won't be committing evil against them, and you won't be committing sin against God if you love him with all of your heart. So yeah, those are basically, that, that encapsulates the entire law. And that's what he even says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And this is what people will try to tell, have been trying to tell me this week too. Well, Jesus said that you just need to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, why did he say that? Well, first of all, because that is the law. All of the law is encapsulated by that. That's what the law is. So you're telling me, it's a commandment that has to do with obeying all of God's laws that he has given to us from the Old Testament. But not only that, this, this quote of loving your neighbor as yourself, I want you to turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 19. I want to see you to see this for yourself. Because the people that say this are so extremely ignorant of God's word, it's, it's laughable. Because people will tell me, Oh, you shouldn't be following Leviticus chapter 20, which says that sodomites ought to be put to death and that you should just love your neighbor as yourself. You should love them. But they have no idea that this is not some new commandment that Jesus gave. Loving your neighbor as yourself is not something that was instituted by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19. Look at verse number 18 and tell me if that looks familiar. Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Isn't it interesting? Leviticus 19 is what Jesus Christ himself is quoting to these people to love your neighbor as yourself. He's quoting scripture from Leviticus. Leviticus 19 is smack dab in between Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, both of which say that homosexuality is an abomination and Leviticus 20 is worthy of death. That's right, amen. So you want me to say Leviticus 19 is okay, at least this verse, but Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 are not okay. It's hypocrisy. It's stupidity. It's people who don't know their Bibles at all who want to just come up and cherry. They're the ones that are cherry. It's funny because they say, oh, you just cherry pick the parts. Look, why would I care necessarily about, about some of these things except the Bible said that it's, that it's as bad as it is? Right? If the Bible didn't say this, I probably wouldn't think it was as big of a deal. To be honest with you, I probably wouldn't think that. But because the Bible says homosexuality is an abomination and it is so wicked and it is something that deserves a death penalty, that's why I believe that. Live it growing up in today's society, I, pro I probably wouldn't th think that. I'd probably just think, well, let them do whatever they want to do. Like, I'm not going to do that, but whatever. But when you start to understand the truth of the matter, and you're going to start to, to be enlightened through God's word and what he said is a righteous uh, judgment on, on that sin. Then you start to think, well, wait a minute, maybe there's something more to it. And that's when you start to understand 
you know what? These people aren't just, just you know, these funny flaming homos that you see on TV that, that you just laugh at and that are ridiculed and that, oh, they're just harmless and that, and that you, could, you could trust them with anything because they're just kind of funny and a little bit different, but they're actually predators. Amen. And they're pedophiles and they're out going to recruit more people and to molest them and get them to become sodomites also. That's what the true agenda is, but you don't always see that because they're not just publicizing that and saying this is what we're all about. <clears throat> but answering all their ignorance is fruitless anyways because they can't receive it because they're not saved. Now, I'm going to close with just one last example of the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, the ones that wanted to execute Jesus, trying to catch him in his words. Turn to John chapter 8. This will be the last place I have you turn. John chapter 8. Because there's one more example where they tried to catch Jesus Christ in his words. Which is yet one more argument against the belief that we hold here. John chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament, the fourth gospel, John. We are in John chapter number 8. Excuse me. This is the all familiar passage of the woman taken in adultery. Because people will try to tell you, well, look, and this is the only one that has any form of credibility at all of someone trying to say that, well, look, you know, Jesus didn't stone the woman that was taken in adultery, even though that is what the law says should have happened. Like the God's law, the Mosaic law, the law that God has given, he says it's a death penalty for adultery. And that is what God's law says. Okay, there's no doubt about that. And I still believe that that is what the law should be. Amen. Okay. But we're going to read this passage because this is what will often be, be thrown out there and say, well, you know, the, the woman taking adultery, she, she, Jesus didn't condemn her and stone her to death. But let's read what this is all about, okay? Look at verse number 2 of John chapter 8. The Bible says, And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees, again, the people who want to put Jesus to death, the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? What are they trying to do to him? They're trying to catch him in his words. And I, and I preach a lot on this when I did my, uh, our Bible study in John chapter 8. But um, they weren't, see, at this time, the, the, the kingdom of Israel didn't really exist because they were under Roman rule and Roman government. The Roman government is, is the one who was deciding what the laws of the land were. Now, they had their own little provinces and they had their local governments and things like that. And the Jews were allowed to carry out certain, you know, certain sentencing and deal with certain crimes. Like it's like a lower court, right? They were able to deal with some of the smaller issues. But something that would be a capital crime, they were not allowed to handle that. Right. They were not allowed by the Roman government to put people to death for adultery. That was not allowed. So if Jesus were to say, yes, she should be stoned, and carry out the sentence, he would be violating the Roman government of that time. This is, again, they're trying to catch him. They're trying to trap him in his words. You have to, you have to in order to understand this, this whole story, you have to get that fact that this is what they're trying to do. Again, it's a, it's a lose-lose situation because if he says, no, don't stone her, then he is violating what Moses' law said. They said if he says not to do that. This is a lose-lose situation. So how does he answer? He answers with wisdom again. And it says in verse 6, This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. The whole reason they brought this to him and said it is because they want to accuse him. They either want to accuse him to all the Jews and say, See, he doesn't believe in Moses' law. Or they want to accuse him to the Roman government and say, See, he's trying to take the law into his own hands. He's a criminal. He needs to be executed. This is what they're trying to do to Jesus Christ. 
And he answers very wisely. It says, but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard him not. So first he's like avoiding foolish questions, right? He's not even answering them. He's ignoring them, just like whatever. It's a stupid question because he, he knows what they're trying to do. Verse number seven, it says, so when they continued asking him, they wouldn't let him alone. He lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now, did Jesus say she should not be stoned? Did he say that that should not be the judgment that she gets? No. On the contrary, he says, hey, if you're without sin, go ahead and cast a stone at her. So he didn't violate Moses' law, but he also convicted them in their own hearts. It says in verse number 8, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And they all realized, okay, yeah, you know, and they were, and especially the people bringing him unto her, <laughs> the scribes and the Pharisees, they were wicked. They were, they were not righteous people. They thought they were, but they weren't. And, but even this, they, they were convicted by their own conscience and they did not carry out that sentence. And it says in verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? And this is important too. Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Under Mosaic law, if someone's going to be put to death, it's at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Would it be right at this point, after everyone left, because Jesus is God, you say, well, Jesus knows that she was an adulterer. Jesus knows that she did wrong. Yes, he does. But if he's truly going to follow the, the Mosaic law, he would still have to have two or three witnesses there to say, this is what this woman did. We saw it. We're witnesses. She committed adultery in order for her to be condemned to death. At this point, nobody's there condemning her. He can't. He can't follow that law. Now, I'm not even saying that he would want to, though, either, because Jesus Christ, when he came the first time, his whole goal was to seek and to save that which was lost. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. That was his mission and his job. He didn't come to set up a kingdom. He didn't come to be the judge. He didn't come to, to do that, to do that role and to do that job. He came as the lamb to sacrifice himself so that everybody could be saved, so that the whole world could be saved. That's why he came. He didn't come to start judging sin, but there is, he is going to come back. And when he comes back the second time, he is going to judge. So when he comes back the second time, if this situation were to arise, he is going to judge. He is going to say, well, yes, this is the law because he already did the first part of, of offering up himself and giving that free gift and giving everybody the forgiveness and the atonement and everything else that's required. But when he comes back, he will be the judge. And it says in verse 11, she said, no man, Lord, no, no one's condemned her. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's what that story is all about. They're trying to trip him up in his words. It's, Jesus isn't saying that the death penalty for adulterers should no longer be the law of the land. That's not what he's teaching there. He was, he was wisely answering and, and dealing with a situation where they're trying to trap him and catch him in his words. And the fact of the matter was that that wasn't the Roman law at the time. It should have been, but it wasn't. And we are commanded to be in, under obedience to the laws of the land now, we don't let the laws of the land trump God's laws, but the law, the, the, the government, human government is established for the punishment of evildoers. That is why we are supposed to have a government. It's to handle the execution or the execution of judgment, right? So whether that be the death penalty, whether that be the fines for, a, you know, for someone stealing, just, just making sure that when somebody does wrong, that justice is taken care of. That was the whole point of human government. And that was the, the power that God had given to human government was to, was to be able to, to deal with these matters. So God said this is what the laws should be. But if the human government says something a little bit different, as long as it's not contradicting God's laws in the sense that like, 
You know, if someone says, you can't go out and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, I'm not going to obey that human government law because that's going to go against God's law to me to, to carry out. But at no point does God ever say that we are to take the law into our own hands and that we are judge, jury, and executioner of these, of these crimes, which is the whole reason why I'm not saying let's go out and pick up stones and start carrying out judgment on people. Because that's not our role. That's not our job. It has not been ordained for us to do that. That is what the human government is. So am I going to try to, to get our human government to have righteous laws? Yes. I will lobby for that. I will try to, to, to make that change and, and to try to live in a society where our government is going to have righteous laws. But I am not going to go out, neither do I advocate going out and just being the executioner yourself. Because that's not what the Bible lays out as the way things ought to be. So, um, my last point, you don't have to turn there. In Matthew 10, the Bible says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And as Christians, that's what you are. We're a sheep, and there are a lot of wolves out there today. He says, Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We need to be wise that these People are out there, they're, they're trying to attack, they're going to try to catch you in your words. Avoid the foolish questions. Don't even go down that path. Don't let them get you sucked into contentions and striving about the law and, and all these other things because it's vain. It's fruitless. We need to be wise and we need to be harmless. Okay? Someone goes to provoke you, let it go. Hopefully you don't have enough pride to where that's going to be a big deal for you. If I didn't have enough humility, it would be easy for me to get all upset and angry at these people who are you know, lying about me and saying, you know, whatever, and just coming with all these nasty things. It would be easy to get, to, get, to get angry and want to go beat someone up or whatever. But look, that is not godly. That's not what God's called us to do. Say whatever you want. Okay? Doesn't bother me. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to keep the hum a humble mind. I'm going to be harmless as, dove, as a dove, but I'm going to be wise as a serpent. I'm not going to answer these, these foolish questions. I'm not going to get stuck in these fights and, and contentions about the, about the law and, and these other things. The enemy's out to attack us, so we need to be wise and not to get caught up in their games. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the, the great wisdom that we can learn from your teaching, dear God. I pray that you would please help us, help us to be humble, not to, not to respond aggressively or not to respond um, at all to the foolish questions that come our way, dear Lord, by people who are not saved, people who don't understand your words because they don't have the Spirit of God residing inside of them, dear Lord. But I pray that you would please help us to... Um, to preach the gospel, to preach your word, so that these people will one day understand um, what, your, what your word is talking about because they do receive the, the Spirit of God. I pray that you please help us to stay focused on that. Lord, um, you know, I, I try not to get in these arguments or debates with people, but rather um, choose to, to use these sources of contention to try to preach the gospel. I pray that you please help us all to be mindful of, of your word and to not be wasting our time, but to be doing the things that, that you really want us to do and be fruitful and multiply in producing other Christians. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.